Sie die Regie setzen. Welcome to Books That Matter, People Who Matter. I'm your host, Leroy Baylor, and we're very happy to have with us a young man who's going to shed some light on his quest to find his own origins. Quite often, people pay quite a sum of money to find out where they're from, especially black people in America. Well, this young man has done research on the Fulani people of that part of the world called Africa and the implications of the Fulani people's uh, uh, lineage or lineage into America. And that's what our subject matter is today. And it'll pay off for a lot of folks to pay attention to how he did his own research. And our guest is Elijah Shabazz of Harlem. Welcome to <laughs> Books That Matter, People Who Matter, Elijah. Thank you, Thank you Black Leroy. Thank you, Brother Leroy. And I'm, it's, it's an honor to be on your show. Thank um, you for being here, brother. I'm going to try to... Uh, uh, get to the point as soon as possible because I know we have a limited amount of time and uh, for me there's so much to say on the subject. Uh, first about myself and how I came to this uh, line of research. Um, I was always into history in general and I, um, I would consider myself an avid reader. Uh, I'm blessed with a thousand books at home and mm -hmm. among those books history is one of my favorite subjects. So I've been reading every other people's history so when I came across something that uh, caused me to study my own history, I jumped into it full-fledged. Um, and it led me on a great, great journey. It started um, with uh, uh, during the month of Ramadan. And for me, this is a, a, a not only a uh, psychological and mental journal, it's journey, it's a spiritual journey. Uh, during the month of Ramadan in 2011, I was uh, downstairs at a masjid uh, on 29th Street called Masjid uh, Abdul Rahman. And um, I was going downstairs uh, to, the, to make wudu. And while I was there, I noticed a gentleman standing up against the wall. Uh, I, there were two lines. Uh, those who, who go pray, you know there's one area where you wash up. There's another area where you relieve yourself. So when I saw the, the, the brother standing there, I thought he was waiting to relieve himself. So I went ahead of him and I sat down and began to wash up for my prayer. But before I could sit down, he looks at me. He looks at me and he knows who I am. Now, I don't know who I am. <laughs> he knows who I am. He knows exactly who I am. He, there was no doubt in his mind as to who I was. So he didn't speak to me in the English language. He spoke to me in the Fulani language. And what was strange about this moment, it was like, I think there was a scene like this in Sankofa. When he was speaking to me, mm -hmm. I looked at him and I, all I could do is just stare. I was dumbfounded because the language he was speaking sounded familiar to me. And there was a part of my mind, my brain pulsating you know, that part of the brain that executes on speaking and thoughts. Uh, it was pulsating because in my mind I was saying, answer him, answer him. But I had no knowledge of which to answer him. But impulsively I knew that I'm supposed to be able to speak back to this man. So he was getting upset. He might have broke his Ramadan because in Ramadan you're not supposed to get upset. <laughs> so he started getting upset because he's talking to me and he's like, why aren't you answering why aren't you answering? You know, you're supposed to speak this language. Why aren't you answering? So after, after uh, a, a minute went by, there were two other gentlemen sitting there, and they began laughing. And they said, oh, he thinks you're somebody else. And then when he realized I didn't speak the language, he just looked and he was like, he was shocked. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were a Fulani. Yeah, uh, you know, so I was speaking to you in Fulani. Then he said in English what I knew he was saying to me in the Fulani language. So then he started speaking to me in English, and I'm still dumbfounded because I'm like, what, you know, what was that? You know, why, 
why did I, why did this language sound familiar even though I never heard it before? So he said it to me in English and I knew it and I, I still said nothing because of the experience. It was, it was an awe-inspiring experience. So that day I, I went home and I, uh, after I came out of that, I was, I was very happy. I was happy because I was identified with my people. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, being here for 400 years, you would think that, you know, after all we've been through, that we have been made so different that our people couldn't identify with us. But I clearly look exactly like the people from West Africa, from where he's from. And he knew what tribe I belonged to because I look like his cousins. So I, I went on my Facebook page and I said, oh, I, I, you know, uh, today I was, um, you know, told I was, I was a Fulani and I was just so happy. And I left it alone, I put it into the back of my mind. And I, I actually forgot after a while, after a few months went by, the name of the tribe. So that same year, to show you how I believe Allah was guiding me, uh, my grand uncle, Alfred Holliday, who was born in South Carolina, particularly Privateer, which I'm going to come back to. Privateer is a county in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> uh, he came and he did a PowerPoint uh, presentation about our family mm -hmm. for, the, for the family reunion. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at all these photos and he's showing my, my grand aunts and my grand uncles and my, my great grandfather and we all have these very, very similar features. I still didn't put two and two together. You know, the, the incident at the masjid and my family's features. It, it just, it, it didn't click just yet. So after that, that presentation, I knew my family was from Sumter, Privateer, South Carolina. So later on that year, uh, I, I was sitting at the Senegal, Senegalese uh, restaurant called African Kind or African Kine uh, on 116th Street. Right. And a, a sister from Senegal was uh, serving us at our table. And I, I just happened to be with some, some Africans. Uh, uh, two were from East Africa, one was Somali, one was from Sudan. And it was myself and another sister from, from here. Um, we had just came from a, a, actually a, a discussion group at Columbia, and um, we all went out to eat together. The discussion was about the African diaspora. So we went to eat at Senegal. The sister looked at the Somali, knew he was Somali. The sister looked at the Sudanese, knew he was Sudanese. And she looked at me and she knew where I was from. <laughs> so as I began to order my food in English, she was shocked, just like the brother at the, at the mash. She was shocked. She said, oh, my God, I thought you were Fulani from, from Guinea. You look exactly like the Fulani from Guinea. You know, so I, I said, wait, I heard this before. And it was then, after seeing her reaction and remembering the brother's reaction earlier that year, that made me say, let me do some research on the Fulani people. So I, I began to research and I, you know, Google Fulani and I saw this, uh, this, this website on Facebook called Fulani Tube. And when I went on there, I was going through the photos. I, it, I reflected on the photos that my grand uncle showed me at the family reunion. I said, these people look just ex exactly like my family. And there was this one photo, I wish I could show it to you uh, uh, right now, that made me scream. It made me scream because the gentleman in the photo looked exactly like me. Now, here's a man born in uh, uh, West Africa, actually Central Africa, Cameroon. Um, same exact facial features, same exact head, same exact everything. I took his photo, put it on my Facebook page. My older sister, who knew me my whole life, looked at the guy and said, Elijah, you need to gain some weight. You know, you're skinny because the guy is very slim. You know, Fulani people are very slim. And I said, Alicia, that's not me. She said, what? Now, here's my older sister that knew me since I was born. Mm -hmm. You see? So I went and did further research, particularly about the people of South Carolina. Now, I had this book on my shelf that has been sitting there, and I never got around to reading it. It was called Black Rice. And in this book called Black Rice, it talked about the, the, uh, the slave master or the slave capturers uh, uh, inclination to um, grab people from Guinea. Because the people of Guinea, Guinea Conakry as it's known right now, have a particular skill. And that skill is the skill of growing rice. That they had a particular skill. They have 
and had. had. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, because if you go to Guinea today, and I've, I've been to Guinea, well, I'll get to that. Um, they have this skill of rice growing. And the Fulani people have the skill of cattle, cattle rearing, and they also have a skill that uh, became vital to the, the, uh, the economy here in America, which is cotton. You know, in, in, in the Fulani language, it's called hotelo. It was the Fulani people who introduced cotton weaving to West Africa, Central Africa, and all those areas. Before, people would just cut, like, animal skin and so forth and so on and, and wear the animal skin. It was the Fulani that, that the first developed the skill of taking cotton and weaving it into clothes. As so you know, the movie Cotton Comes to Harlem. Mm -hmm. This was big business. So the rice, South Carolina became so rich from these, uh, rice, these skilled rice growers that they're the ones who started the Civil War. They said, we don't, we don't need the rest of the Union because, you know, we... We have an, uh, uh, an economy where we could basically survive as our own nation. And they wanted to separate. And that started the Civil War. That's because they had skilled laborers. Growing rice takes a particular science, a particular skill. You can't just drop some seeds in the ground and rice grows. Now, there were some people called the Gullah people of South Carolina. And the Gullah people were never enslaved. The reason why they were never enslaved is because rice was so important to South Carolina. In fact, South Carolina was exporting rice to Europe. It was big business. The swamplands of on the Gullah Islands of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia is so critical to growing rice. You need swamplands in order to grow rice. But the Caucasian people, they weren't used to that type of environment. So they let the Gullah people alone so that they could grow the rice and they would come send the ships, pick up mm -hmm. the rice and just let those people free. Those people were never enslaved. And these are what's called the Gullah or the Geechee people. Now, among these Geechee people are Fulani people. And the way the, the clear evidence that there are Fulani people among them is one, they, they have the, term, the word Fula there. Uh, two, they have Fulani words among their Gullah language. And three, if you ask them to count in African, they'll say Go, Didi, Tati, Nai, Joey, Jago, J, Didi, J, Tati. All these are Fulani numbers. Mm -hmm. They count in the Fulani language. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, mm. the, these uh, are people, among them, they are people that's called red bone. Now, the red bone are Fulani people. No, there's no doubt that they are Fulani people. But because... Most people are ignorant that to the fact that there is a West African tribe that has a copper colored red complexion. They thought that these people uh, got this complexion from mixing with the white and the Indian mm. and this mm. admixture. Mm. And somehow there was some mm. controlled experiment mm. that caused these people to be red skin or copper colored mm. uh, tone, which is, you know, my complexion, your complexion. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know that there was a whole race of people already in Africa with this same complexion because most of these Europeans that came here, these European settlers, they never been to Africa, so they know nothing about the diversity of Africans. And, and our people, having lost the knowledge of themselves, also didn't know. So the, the stereotypical African is broad nose, thick lips, dark, dark skin, kinky, kinky mm -hmm. hair. Right. Red bone people, hair is somewhat straight, mm -hmm. you know, somewhat curly, straighter. Uh, their noses are not as wide and their lips are not as thick. So they s saw these people and they said, oh, this is a different race. Now, from where my family's from, which is privateer Sumter, uh, uh, South Carolina, you had a group called the Redbone, you know, people. And they also said that these people were never enslaved. They found these people in the thick of the forest and they were doing exactly what Fulani people do cattle rearing. Fulani are known for their cattle. Everywhere Fulani are in West Africa, there's tons of, you know, thousands and thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of cattle. There's one red bone gentleman they said had, had 30,000 head of cattle. You see? And they were also, you know, so there, there was great speculation about where does these people come from because they don't look like the typical Africans. So that's when they began to come up with these elaborate theories that Oh, these people must be of mixed race. Redbone in uh, on the Gullah Island, Redbone in Privateer, Redbone in West Virginia. 
Now, in West Virginia, before I go back to privateer, West Virginia, they were called guineas. Now, you, most people know this term from the pejorative that they use for Italians. Yes. They call them guineas. Yes. Now, because they, they uh, uh, considered the red bone to be of mixed race, anybody of mixed race, they called them guineas because, you know, it, it, was, it was parallel with the red bones, mm -hmm. who they considered of mixed race. But the red bones themselves said, no, we are from Guinea. We're not of no, you know, we didn't originate here. We originate in, in Guinea. Guinea, what is known as Guinea Conakry. And um, so uh, saying that, when the, the, the Italians came, their hair was a little nappy and so forth and so on, and said, oh, you're a Guinea too. So it became a pejorative term to say, oh, you're, you're mixed with the, the Africans, the Guineas. Um, so going back to privateer, it was these red bones that went over to Louisiana. Now, in Louisiana, you have also what's called um, uh, the red bone culture. And, and some of our people who are descendants of red bone because they don't have a knowledge of themselves, they say, I'm descendant of Creolian Indian, you know, because mm -hmm. this is what they've been told. This is what my family was told. Mm -hmm. my, my whole life, we, we were told we were mixed with Indians and, mm -hmm. and, what, and there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But there's plenty of evidence that says we come straight from the Fulani of mm -hmm. West Africa. Uh, the the, the uh, Louisiana, particularly the people of New Orleans, they are 90, they say 95% of them come from Guinea. 95% of the people from New Orleans come from Guinea. And what's called Creole, you know, some people think Creolian is a, is a, is a, is a, is a DNA. No, Creole just means a language. And right. in the language, in their Creole in Louisiana, it's the same language as a Guinea, which is the Susu language, the Mandinka language, and the Fulani language. And again, you have the red bone there who are cattle rearers. And then these red bones left from privateer, they, they went to Louisiana and they herded their cattle. They walked their cattle just like they do in West Africa, as uh, one of our uh, great brothers and DNA scholars, uh, Clyde Winters, pointed out, that they have this, this east-west migration pattern just like you know, the Fulani of West Africa. This is the same migration pattern. So they begin to migrate west, like they do in Africa. And so they went from South Carolina to Louisiana and then over to Texas. It was the red bone that established the cattle rearing culture in Texas, which means the cowboy culture in Texas. And, and what's amazing is that um, Fulani people all over West Africa, they know about the state of Texas. That's one state they mm. know about, particularly the, the nomadic Fulani, and they get excited when they hear the name Texas mm. because they know there are cowboys there. And I told one Fulani nomad, I said, uh, yes, and those were your people, our people who started that culture. As you know, the, the face of cowboy has changed to Caucasian. Yes. Now, I, I, I say this uh, on that point because now... <laughs> It's, you know, the, the, how they, uh, you know, people just like to steal our culture. Now, if you go online, and I, I recently went online to look up Redbone. It's a white boy singing a country song, I'm a Redbone, you know. And you see the images, they all Caucasian, you know. To give the impression that these great people that started this great culture yes. are Caucasian people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, then they go even further, with their, uh, their, their, their stealing of the culture, and they do a DNA analysis and a DNA interpretation. This one woman, uh, she didn't give her name, but it's online. You can look up DNA of, of Redbone people, and you'll come across this video presentation. This woman, uh, you know, she also has images of Caucasian people through the whole presentation, and she gives this genetic breakdown. <clears throat> The genetic breakdown is that the Fulani uh, or the red bone have R1B. All one B. All one. All one B. Haplogroup R one B. This is the the red bone. The the, the DNA breakdown of the red bone. They have. Oh, I, I understand. That's the DNA term. Yes, the DNA so term. All one B. Where I'm in the kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta bring me up. You the research. <laughs> you said, wait a minute. <laughs> we got eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes. So. Um, uh, half of group R1B, that's why I knew I had to rush through because I knew I wouldn't have enough time. There's so much to say on the subject. Half of group R1B, half of group J1, and half of group uh, EB38. Uh, now, R1B 
is also found in Europeans. So she takes this to say that this is evidence that the red bones are of Caucasian descent. But she left out totally that the Fulani of Cameroon, where my twin comes from, they also have higher percentage of R1B than Caucasian people. And they try to make it seem like that uh, the, the Jews brought the R1B here, but the Jews have only 1% to 4% mm -hmm. of R1B, whereas the Fulani have, particularly the nomadic Fulani, the pure Fulani, have close to 40%. And they can't have that without yeah. being the originators or the, the, yeah. the mothers, the fathers yes. of that DNA. Yes, exactly. Whereas our mindsets, when we, when we read something as it relates to heritage, we automatically are almost going back to yeah, Europe yes. or looking that we have some European aspect that <laughs> gives us a greater status. This is mental, yes. mental deduction, yes. mental yes. enslavement. Yes. But, but um, mm. yes. what's the significance? Mm. The, the research that you've shared is, is, is great and it's on your own, yes. mm -hmm. reading and, and interacting with some other people, because you mentioned the historian Clay, the, the, Clyde Winters, yes, Clyde, Clyde Winters, Winters yes, yeah. that the, the, the persons, the people looking at this, this program, mm -hmm. what are the messages that they should be getting from what you've shared with us though, so far? Well, the main message is that we, we, we have to stop allowing other people to steal our culture. And, and if, we don't, if we don't have a knowledge of our own culture, then we will, we will also be fooled, as we have been uh, in our own family lines. Like I said, my family thought we were mixed with Indian and all these different cultures, when we, we clearly, you know, come from a West mm -hmm. African people mm -hmm. that have the same exact DNA that we have. And, um, and, and uh, it's the same way when I travel to uh, Morocco. You know, I, I go there and I'm looking for the great Berber people who, you know, conquered southern Spain and...